If you were a soldier trapped underground with an evil creature trying to turn you against your friends, what would you do? These men think that they're in for an easy victory, but they're about to find out that enemy troops aren't the only threat. I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Angel of War in Bunker. <laughs> This squad expects to fight for their lives, but they have no idea just how crazy things are about to get. Deep in the trenches on the Eastern Front of the First World War, a group of British soldiers sits around preparing for their next battle. One of the men, Lance Corporal Walker, uses a shaving razor to dig bugs out of his skin. The youngest, Private Lewis, asks Private Gray to cover his shift on watch, but his answer is a firm no. Just then, the group's commanding officer, Lieutenant Turner, shows up and scolds Walker for leaving his post. The lieutenant sends Lewis out on guard duty and checks his pocket watch, showing that it's just after 11 p.m. An American officer, Captain Hall, arrives with some reinforcements for the British soldiers, a young man named Private Baker, and a new medic, Private Segura. The lieutenant thanks him, but the captain says that before he goes, he needs a report on the current situation for the general. The two officers leave, and Captain Hall orders his men to behave themselves while he's gone. Gray calls Baker over, asking him how old he is. Baker responds that he's just 18 years old, and Gray shakes his head, saying that things must have been bad if they're sending them kids as backup. He offers Baker a drink, and the kid hesitantly takes a swig, spitting it back up in disgust as if it's his first time. Gary turns his attention to Segura, offering him a sip, but he turns it down, saying that alcohol dulls the senses. Explosions sound off in the distance, scaring Baker, but the older men tell him not to worry unless he can hear the incoming shells whistling. Deciding to mess with the new guy, Gary tells Baker that what he really needs to be afraid of are the ghouls of no man's land. He explains that the abandoned trenches and tunnels serve as a home for deserters and soldiers who were left for dead, and that the creatures become less human every day, living underground like ants and feeding on the rotten remains after each battle. He warns Baker to sleep with one eye open, saying that the ghoul's favorite targets are boys fresh off of the boat. The men laugh, and Baker looks to Segura, who shakes his head in disapproval. Meanwhile, the lieutenant explains to the captain that they're stuck in the middle of a never-ending stalemate, with numbers and resources wearing too thin for both armies, each side more or less just waiting for the others to starve. Just then, Lewis runs into the trench and reports to the lieutenant that it looks like the Germans have retreated and abandoned their outpost. The lieutenant watches through his binoculars as his men fire a mortar at the enemy position. No noticing that the attack draws no response. He gathers the men in the trench and explains that from what he can see, the Germans are gone. A thick layer of fog has rolled in, and he plans to use it as cover to sneak across to No Man's Land and capture the outpost. The captain chimes in that they should hit the position with more artillery, just to be sure. The group of soldiers head to the trench line, and the lieutenant lays out his plan. He says that he and Gray will go first, and when they give the signal, the captain and Lewis will follow. After that, the rest of the men must cross, with Baker and Segura covering Walker as he lays down the communications wire, and the lieutenant and Gray climb out of the trench. They crawl across the battlefield, signaling Captain Hall with a flashlight once they've reached the other side. The captain and Lewis follow next, before signaling to the last group that it's safe to cross. With Segura leading the way, the three men climb out of the trench and make their way to the enemy position. Suddenly, an injured German soldier grabs Baker. Baker draws his trench knife, stabbing the man over and over again, and Segura rushes in, covering the man's mouth and helping Baker finish him. The men make it to the enemy trench, and the lieutenant leads the party deeper into the outpost. They search for any signs of the enemy, but nobody seems to be there. Further down the trench, they spot the German bunker, noticing that it's been sealed off from the outside. They open the bunker, and the lieutenant slowly leads the way down the dark tunnel, but that was their worst mistake. Inside, the group comes to a sudden stop, and the lieutenant kneels down, illuminating a tripwire with his lighter. He carefully cuts the wire, and the men proceed deeper into the darkness below. They come to the bunker's main chamber, and the lieutenant flips a switch, turning on all the lights for the first time. With the rest of the 
the bunker revealed, the men stare in horror at an unexpected discovery, a German soldier pinned up to the support beams with bayonets through his hands. Now, before we get too far here, we wanted to quickly check in with some of our friends all throughout the How to Beat video. If you want to look like the cool protagonist from your favorite horror movie, we suggest the official uniform of How to Beat video employees. These are the only shirts in the market specifically designed for signaling to the world you give great movie recommendations and are tailor-made for fending off the following. Serial killers, axe murderers, werewolves, death games of all shapes and sizes, fast zombies, slow zombies, medium fast zombies, sexy vampires, ugly vampires, giant spiders, goblins, ghouls, ghosts, and gremlins. Aside from their unique defensive properties, they also just look really cool. So whether you're a video store employee or just someone who wants the world to know you're having a damn good day, head on over to the link in the description and order your apparel today. Suddenly, the German starts to move, and the lieutenant orders the men to get him down. He tells Segura to tend to the man's wounds, hoping that if they can keep him alive, they can get some information out of him about exactly what happened down there. Meanwhile, Walker searches around the room and notices what looks like scratches from human fingernails in the boards holding up the wall. They pull the bayonets out of the German's hands and lower him to the ground, offering him a drink of water. The lieutenant says that they should take the man and head back topside and the group starts to make their way towards the bunker's exit. Just then, they hear the whistling of incoming artillery fire as a round explodes right outside of the bunker, killing the captain instantly, with Gray buried beneath the rubble. They try desperately to dig him out, but another canister drops through the ceiling, filling the chamber with white gas, and forcing the men to retreat deeper into the bunker. They find a stash of gas masks, putting them on just in time and closing off the chamber with a big piece of canvas, leaving Gray for dead. Sometime later, the lieutenant checks his watch, seeing that enough time has passed and the smoke should be gone. He takes Lewis and Baker, and they head out to see what they can find. They come to the gas canister, and the lieutenant makes sure that it's empty. With Gray dead, the lieutenant orders Lewis Lewis to take over his duties on the radio and contact their outpost. He tells Baker to get Segura and the German and make sure that the chemicals are covered up. Segura and the German start shoveling dirt onto the gas shell. Looking up, he notices a metal grate in the ceiling. Okay, this whole operation just went to hell in a handbasket. Before I launched a spur-of-the-moment assault on a heavily fortified enemy position, I'd want to make sure that I wasn't leading myself directly into a slaughter. So I'd want to send over a few more shipments of airborne high explosives before making my move. They're fairly confident that the enemy is gone, but what they don't know yet is something even worse is waiting for them. The thing is, whether you're fighting an opposing army or the ghouls of no man's land, a little extra mortar fire could go a long way towards making sure that they're turned into ground beef when you get there, keeping my men safe and I to fight another day. Now once we were already safely behind enemy lines, one good look at that bunker would tell me everything I needed to know about how to proceed. The door was blocked from the outside, and it wouldn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that the Germans weren't trying to keep us out, they were trying to keep something in. Knowing what I know about the undead, my execution of the plan is going to be a little different. First, I'm stationing two of the men. Let's go with Walker, since he's in trouble for leaving his post, and Baker, since he's the new guy, outside of the main entrance to stand guard. Then, I'm taking the others and checking out the rest of the trench to see what else I can find before I head below ground. There's got to be at least one other exit to the bunker around there somewhere, and I'd want to make sure I knew where it was before going inside. Searching the area, I might have come across the top end of the gate that Segura later notices in the ceiling of the bunker. After that, I'd leave Captain Hall topside with a rope. That way, I'd still have an officer above ground and a potential escape route if we got caved in. There should be plenty of explosives down down there somewhere, so I'd be looking to use these things to blast our way out if I couldn't come up with a safer strategy. Next, I'm sending Lewis and the German deeper into the bunker to look around and see if they can find a back exit, with orders to make the German walk in front and watch out for more booby traps so they don't get blown up. Even though he's the enemy, I'm sure that the German would want to get out of there just as bad as we do and point us to an exit that would have taken us a while to find on our own. Best case scenario, they come back with an easy way out, and worst case, at least they'll be able to tell me some more information about what's down there. Now, with Baker on shovel duty and Lewis and the Germans scouting out the tunnels, that leaves the Lieutenant, Segura, and Walker to come up with a plan C. Since he was injured in the artillery strike, I'm leaving Walker on radio duty. Meanwhile, the Lieutenant and Segura should have picked up on an important piece of information. 
that the gas shell had to go down into the tunnel somehow, and the gas had to go somewhere. So that means there's an opening in the bunker's ceiling that's already clear to the surface, and my money's on that grate being our best chance at escape. If you remember, I'd originally left Captain Hall on the surface up above, so if he survived the artillery strike, he should be able to lower a rope down and help us climb out. After all, all we'd have to do is get that grate off, which shouldn't be too hard with all of the tools down there, and then our escape would be just a short climb away. With all of these options at our disposal, it shouldn't be too hard to make our way back to the surface, but it looks like the lieutenant wants to take a different approach, and we'll have to see if they can make it out before whatever's down there starts picking them off. Meanwhile, Baker and Lewis sit at the communications post waiting for a signal. Lewis starts to pray, and suddenly the radio chirps to life. He picks up the receiver and tries to call out for backup while an injured walker lays on a stretcher nearby, obsessively scratching his neck. The lieutenant goes to check on Segura, ordering him to finish up there and then start digging through to the trench. Segura asks if they should expect backup, but he says that their only way to escape is to dig their way out and takes the German for interrogation. The lieutenant checks the men's pockets for identifying papers, but all that he finds is a small knight figurine. He asks him if he speaks any English, but the German just ignores him. Growing frustrated, he tells the man that he owes them for saving his life and that he should cooperate since they're going to be down there for a while. Just then, Segura shows up and shows the men that the gas canister was actually a German round. The lieutenant points out that there's no way the enemy could have known that they'd taken over the bunker and questions what could have led them to strike their own position. Meanwhile, Walker continues scratching at his skin and talking to himself. He rips off his jacket, itching all over his body before taking out a razor blade and carving into his arm. Suddenly, Lewis notices what's going on. He screams for help, and Segura sprints into the room, pinning Walker against the wall. The lieutenant rushes in and helps disarm Walker, while Baker runs off on his own, trying to process what he's just witnessed. Alone in the tunnels, Baker sees something in the darkness and pulls out his lighter to take a closer look. He's startled when he comes across a German soldier wearing a gas mask, but quickly realizes that the man is dead, with several more bodies piled up in the tunnel behind him. Seguro comes to check on him and explains that he's just found a mass grave, an easier way to store the dead men than giving them each their own hole. Lewis sits at the radio, still trying to get in touch with backup but the lieutenant shows up and orders him to take a break, neither of them noticing a bubbling mass growing on Walker's neck. Segura continues trying to shovel their way out when a strange white liquid drips down onto his hand. The rest of the men are sleeping, and Lewis wakes up to see a bloody, gas mask wearing Walker standing over him. Without warning, Walker takes a shovel and stabs Lewis in the leg. Baker jumps out of bed, but Walker smashes him across the face with a shovel, knocking him to the floor. Segura runs in and grabs the shovel, while the lieutenant jumps on Walker from behind. They struggle, and the lieutenant rips off his gas mask. Walker convulses spitting up a bunch of white goo before falling to the ground dead. Okay, just when I thought being buried alive in a bunker on the front lines of World War I couldn't get any worse. It looks like they've got some sort of mind-controlling fungus down there with them, and who knows how many of the men have already been infected. With Walker going full zombie mode and attacking his friends with a shovel, first of all, as soon as I caught that guy cutting off chunks of his arm with a razor, I would have restrained him with some rope to make sure he couldn't hurt himself or anyone else. Then it would be time to have Segura look him over and see if we could figure figure out what was wrong with him before things escalate any further. Instead of taking the proper precautions to make sure that the obviously insane man isn't a threat, they decide to just let him get some sleep unsupervised. And sure enough, he goes on a bloody rampage as soon as their backs are turned. As soon as I saw him swinging that shovel around, I would have done what I needed to do to make sure that he wouldn't come after me. Two quick shots and it'd be lights out for Bug Boy and we could figure out what made him go postal after the fact. Whatever that tentacle thing that came out out of him was, I don't need a medical professional to tell me that it isn't good. Since they got in the tunnel, Walker didn't really touch anything, but he was complaining about the bugs infecting his skin. The most likely explanation is that the bugs were somehow related to what happened, meaning that the infection must be coming from the soil. I'd be extra careful not to eat or drink anything that we found down there, and to watch out for any bugs or plants that could be spreading the infection. We still really don't know what's going on, but now it's time to take a break from digging and make 
make sure that we're safe from the fungus among us. First order of business, I'm stomping on that tentacle thing until it's red jelly. It might be about to turn into some sort of body-stealing creature, and I sure as hell wouldn't be giving it a chance to do so on my watch. Next, we're taking Walker's body over to the mass grave that Baker found and sealing that part of the tunnel off. Some explosives should do the trick, caving that part of the tunnel in and removing that threat from the equation. Now that we know there's a mind-controlling fungus down there with us, I'd start watching the other guys much more carefully for any signs that they're turning and be ready to take them out if it came to it. Other than that, all I see that they can do is get back to their escape plan, but something tells me we've far from seen the last of what this bunker has to hide. Sugura goes back to the radio and hears backup trying to reach them. He reads them the bunker's coordinates, and they say that they'll be there soon before asking how many men are trapped with him. He explains that there are only four of them left, with one captured German, and they order him to keep that man alive. Communications end for now. Sagura goes to see the lieutenant and asks him what he thinks happened to Walker. He responds that it must have been shell shock, but Sagura disagrees. Sagura mentions that he made contact with backup over the radio, but suddenly the lieutenant snaps at him, shouting that it's Lewis's job to oversee communications, not his. Snapping out of it, he orders Sagura to have the German take over digging so that he can collect his thoughts. The prisoner gets to work while Sagura writes in his journal. The man tells him that his name is Kurt, and Sagura asks what he did that made the others nail him up to the wall. Kurt says that he can't easily explain, but something evil is in the tunnels with them, and it wants to get all of the men under its control. Meanwhile, Lewis and Baker work together taking stock of their supplies. Lewis starts to freak out and grabs Baker, knocking a can to the floor and revealing that it was full of white muck. He picks it up and then starts opening can after can, showing Baker that they're all full of repulsive goo. The lieutenant comes back to check out the rations, and after realizing that they have no food or supplies, he says that they have even less time to survive than they first thought, and they need to focus all of their efforts on getting out. Getting closer, he whispers to Lewis that the Americans seem too friendly with the German prisoner. He orders them to make sure that Segura doesn't touch the radio again, adding that the the only people that they can trust now are themselves. Back at the radio, Lewis sits alone, reading from his prayer book and rubbing the strange thing that came out of Walker. Segura hears a mysterious noise from somewhere deep in the bunker and cautiously goes to check it out. He sees that the dark tunnel is illuminated by a strange blue light. He creeps forward, and just then the lights all around him go out, surrounding him in darkness. He looks around, and it's as if he's back out on the battlefield, walking forward, he comes to a grave site and notices that the cross is dipping white liquid into a pool on the ground. Three strange tentacles emerge from the puddle, and suddenly Segura snaps out of it, finding himself back in the bunker as a loud siren blares through the tunnels. Baker comes running and throws him a gas mask, and the four men run to the storage room looking for the source of the sound. Segura finds a siren behind the shelves, and the lieutenant takes it from him, smashing it on the ground and quieting the noise. The lieutenant the lieutenant shouts at Segura, accusing him of working with the German and pointing his bayonet straight at his chest. Lewis runs to stop him, and the lieutenant reluctantly apologizes, saying that something must be wrong with the air down there. He turns his attention to the German and orders Baker to put him back to work, but Segura shouts at him to put down his weapon. The lieutenant tells Segura that if he tries anything else, he'll kill him, and orders all of the men to get back to their posts. Segura gives Baker and Kurt each a bayonet net, telling them to stick with him. At his post by the radio, Lewis receives an incoming call from their backup. He tells them that he doesn't know how much longer they will last, and the voice says that he has been chosen by God and must show the other men the way to salvation. Meanwhile, the lieutenant sits alone sharpening his bayonet, looking like he's completely lost it. Segura takes a break from digging and notices that Gray's body is gone, with a bunch of strange white roots growing in his place. As he heads back to the other men, he stops to check out the tripwire and covers it with more dirt. Lewis goes to check on the lieutenant and finds him wrapping up a spool of barbed wire with his bare hands. He orders Lewis to gather up all of their weapons and keep
keep it a secret from the others for now. The Americans stop for a break, and Baker tells Segura that he's starting to feel like something supernatural is toying with them. Lewis hobbles into the room and tells them that the lieutenant wants to speak with everyone. Back in the main chamber, the lieutenant throws his bayonet in the dirt, saying that they need to put the tension behind them. He points out that they have no food or water, and that backup is still far away, but they must maintain order under his leadership if they're going to survive. He orders the others to put down their weapons, and Segura, Baker, and Kurt all reluctantly throw their bayonets to the center of the room. The lieutenant says that they're making progress, but they need to be prepared in case they have to fight when they manage to get out. Going forward, he wants Kurt under his direct supervision and commands him to take a seat in the corner. Finally, he tells the men that any questioning of his authority is treason and orders them to get back to work. Once they're gone, the lieutenant goes to Lewis and tells him that they must stick together no matter what happens. Lewis goes back to his post at the radio and falls asleep as the strange white goo drips from the ceiling, filling his cup. Waking up, he takes a cautious sip before chugging the whole thing down. Meanwhile, Segura crawls down a dark passage with his light and shovel and starts digging. He hits some of the white roots and pulls on them, revealing that they're growing out of the mouth of the American captain's dead body which was just buried in the dirt. Suddenly, the tunnel starts to collapse and Baker pulls him to safety just in time. Sitting alone, Kurt has a flashback to his childhood where he came across a sinister altar hidden somewhere deep in the woods. Lewis sits at the radio listening to static come through the headphones while the lieutenant stockpiles weapons, his damaged watch no longer telling the correct time. Segura looks up and notices that more white roots are growing through the metal grate in the ceiling. He hears Baker shout for him and comes running to find Lewis putting the lieutenant in a chokehold, holding an armed hand grenade. Segura tells him to put it down, but he responds that he's taking orders from a higher power and starts to pray. Baker picks the grenade's pin up from the ground and lunges for Lewis's arm, trying to wrestle the explosive away without setting it off. Before he can stop him, Lewis releases the lever, and the lieutenant dives away as the grenade explodes. After the explosion, the lieutenant crawls back over to Lewis, who lays dying on the floor. He tells him that he'll be all right, but in reality, Lewis is already super dead. Baker wakes up and starts screaming when he realizes that his hand is completely gone. Sugura runs to help him, tying off the wound to stop the bleeding. Okay, talk about an explosive argument. I'd give Baker a hand for his bravery, but I don't think that I'd be able to find it. After the lieutenant and Lewis both snapped, it was clear what needed to happen. They're infected with the same thing that made Walker lose it, and I'd want to eliminate the threat before they went berserk and killed me first, so here's what I would have done. I don't want to risk direct confrontation with the psychos, so I'm gonna take the sneaky approach. First, I'd go get that booby trap that we passed at the entrance and carefully reload locate it to a spot deep down in the dark tunnel that Seguro was digging. Then, I'd go for the lieutenant and tell him that we almost made it out, but that we'd hit a spot that was too hard to dig through. Being as stubborn as he is, he would have crawled down the tunnel himself to check it out, and blammo! No more fish and chips for him. Next, I'd call Lewis over to help and put one in the back of his head while he was distracted. Now, if I'd let them live long enough to get to the grenade standoff that we just saw, I wouldn't be putting myself in harm's way to save either of them. Instead of trying to go for the grenade, I would have started slowly backing away and dove for cover when it looked like Lewis was going to let that thing off. There's no reason for me to stop him, and if he takes himself and the lieutenant out for me, that's all the better. Either way, with the lieutenant and Lewis out of the picture, it'd be time to get back to work on our other two remaining problems. The strange white roots that seem to be causing the infection and the process of actually getting out of there. The white goo from the roots seemed to have infested all of the food stored down there, so I obviously wouldn't be touching any of that. It looks like the roots are feeding off on the dead bodies, so what I would do is try to lace the corpses with some kind of poison and kill the fungus that way. There should be rat poison or motor oil or something like it down there in the storage room, so maybe I could use it to rot those roots from the inside out. The grate in the ceiling still seems like the best route out of there, and with the crazies out of the picture, I'd have plenty of time to stack objects and try to climb out through it. Unfortunately, the lieutenant isn't dead yet, and I have a feeling he'll be causing more trouble before this is all over. Segura 
Sarah hears a call on the radio and goes to answer it. The voice tells him that backup won't be there for a while unless they can guarantee Kurt's safety when they arrive. He asks him why, and the voice starts to turn him against the others, telling him that he's been chosen just like it did to Lewis. Suddenly, Kurt fires his rifle into the radio, and the strange white goo starts leaking out of the bullet hole. Sagura takes the weapon and fires two more shots into it, before opening up the top and revealing a pulsating mass of flesh inside where electronics should be. He steps back and empties his weapon into the radio, making sure that whatever's in there is dead. He follows the radio wire, realizing that it's been hooked into the strange white roots the whole time. Sagura turns to Kurt, asking him what's going on, but the German refuses to talk. Frustrated, Sagura aims his rifle at him as a last resort. Kurt walks forward, grabbing the barrel of the weapon, and tells him that the creature is a dark god, the angel of war, and he's been cursed by it since he was a child. He explains that the creature draws power from conflicts, and once it has you as its target, it can't be stopped. Meanwhile, the lieutenant kneels in the center of the cave, with gallons of the white slime pouring down on his bald head. The men walk into the chamber, and the lieutenant points his revolver at Sagura, blaming him for everything that's happened. Sagura begs him to be reasonable, but the lieutenant won't back down, and fires a bullet into Kurt's stomach as Baker grabs him from behind. The lieutenant bites Baker, and shoves him away as Sagura lunges towards him, tackling him to the floor. They exchange punches, but the lieutenant manages to get away, pulling out his bayonet and getting ready to finish the job. He dives at Sagura, taking him to the ground, but Sagura slaps him on the side of the head, stunning him, and follows up with several hard punches to the face. The scuffle continues, but the lieutenant gets the upper hand, stabbing Sagura twice and stomping on his back. He goes to the grate in the ceiling, cackling like a madman, when suddenly Baker blasts him with the revolver. The lieutenant turns around to face him, letting out a demonic scream, and Baker empties the gun into him. Sagura runs to Kurt and sees that he's badly wounded. He tries to help him, but Kurt tells him to leave him behind and get out while he still can. Sagura promises to come back for him, and looks at the grate in the ceiling, decided that they'll climb through it to escape. He runs around the bunker, stacking crates underneath the hole, and an explosion breaks the grate open. While he's distracted, Kurt dies, and the strange roots start growing out of a bullet hole in his stomach. Okay, I knew British Mr. Clean with a mustache was going to be an issue before the end, and I can't say I'm sad to see him go. Sagura had a rifle when he walked into the room, so why the hell did he put it down when the lieutenant started pointing his revolver at him? The guy was obviously out of his mind, and I would have one-tapped him as soon as I came around the corner. If Sagura had taken him out quickly, Kurt would still be alive, which is important since the demonic voice on the radio specifically told them that if they could ensure his safety, everything would be fine. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a deal to me. And after hearing that, my number one priority would be to make sure Kurt didn't end up with a revolver round in his kidney. Since he didn't take the shot when he had the opportunity, Sagura barely manages to survive the fight, but with the lieutenant dead, he can get back to working on his escape plan. I've been saying all along that the Great was their best bet to get out of there, and it's nice to see someone finally catching on. Before I left, I would have checked on Kurt one more time to see if he was still alive and worth going back for later. If Sagura had given him one more check, he would have noticed the roots growing out of the bullet hole and known that Kurt was infected too. To make sure that he didn't come back after us after we were climbing out, I would have fired a few rounds into him and officially put him out of his misery for good. I'd also want to take something as evidence of what happened to show my commanding officers when I made it out. Some documents or even one of the food tins full of goo could have been helpful to bring with me. Although, if I took an actual sample of the stuff up to the surface, I'd need to be extremely careful to make sure that I didn't accidentally infect anyone else. The only way to go is up, and it's time for Baker and Segura to start climbing, but they're about to find out that the bunker isn't done with them just yet. Baker and Segura climb up through the hole, finally emerging onto the surface as a battle rages all around them. Baker asks him to find his mother and tell her what happened if he doesn't make it, and passes out as Segura shouts for help. Just just then, two American soldiers show up and load Baker onto a stretcher. They ask Segura if he's coming with them, but he says that there's still one more person that he needs to save. Segura climbs back down into the hole and finds that the entire bunker is overgrown with the strange roots. He goes looking for Kurt, but in his place, he finds a sinister-looking
walking blue orb glowing from the floor. Suddenly, he's back on the hellish blue battlefield, and he sees himself as a child standing in the center of an enormous tree made out of rubble and body parts. He gets closer, and a monstrous arm grabs him dragging him in. Sagura wakes up in the bunker and sees that Kurt has transformed into a horrific root monster, breaking itself away from the wall and staggering towards him. He hits it with a shovel and spits up a bunch of the white goo as he crawls away. The monster follows after him and Sagura looks up at the hole in the ceiling but decides to fight instead. He crawls to the tripwire as the monster grabs his leg, its roots taking over his body, and detonates the explosive, blowing the entire bunker up in a ball of flames. Okay, here I was thinking that Sagura was the only smart one, but I guess he just proved me wrong. I was really rooting for you, man. But now it looks like you're pushing up daisies. First of all, I would have never gone back down into that bunker after just barely escaping with my life. One time being stuck down there is plenty for me, thanks. And I'd let another squad go pick up the pieces if they felt the need to. Now, if I'd completely lost any sense of self-preservation and decided to go back down there for Kurt, that weird glowing orb wouldn't have made it 10 seconds before I turned it into a pile of blue jelly. I would have shot it, stabbed it, kicked it across the cave like a soccer ball, whatever I needed to do to make sure it was dead. Evil Groot wasn't exactly the most intimidating monster, and personally, I'd feel very confident in my ability to take him on in a fight without having to sacrifice myself like our hero ultimately does. He's incredibly slow, and looks like he gets hurt when Sagura whacks him with that shovel, which means he can be damaged even with conventional weapons. The bunker is full of guns, bayonets, explosives, and even electricity, all of which could be used to get the better of the creature. I would just run around the tunnels with the thing following slowly behind me, hitting it with whatever I could find and dodging its strikes until I eventually killed it. I could disconnect one of those light bulbs and maybe use the electricity to set the creature on fire. If nothing else worked, the tripwire should definitely do the trick, and there really wasn't much need for him to activate it by hand and blow himself up in the process. I would have tried to lead the creature far away from the tunnels, and then ran back to the grate as fast as I could. Then, I'd carefully relocate the tripwire into the creature's path, and hopefully, by the time he waddled over and set it off, I'd be back up the hole and out of harm's way. It might not be the way that I would have done things, but I'll still give Sagura credit for managing to take the monster out and ending the nightmare once and for all. Back on the surface, Sagura's journal lies in the dirt, covered up by the chaos of the ongoing battle. Only Baker knows what's really happened down there, but nobody would believe him if he told them, and the truth will have to remain buried with the men in the bunker. What would you do? If you were trapped with your brothers in arms underground, would you band together and show those monsters who's boss? Let us know in the comments down below. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this. And don't forget from now on, we upload on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.